our next presenter is going to just uh, carry it forward. Welcome to the webinar, Pam Marone. Hi, I'm Pam Marone, CEO and founder of Marone Bioinnovations. I'm going to talk to you about biologicals, specifically biopesticides or bioprotection, because we have later speakers talking about biostimulants. And I'll start with uh, just a broad overview of biologicals and a, a little primer on them or primer on them. And then I'm going to talk about some products, including our own. And then I'm going to wrap up with some uh, science about the microbes and soil health. So uh, I'm going to share my screen now and uh, put on my PowerPoint. Okay. And oops, there's my dogs. Okay, let's see. And now put this on slideshow. Okay, very good. Uh, just a, a, a warning that we are a public company. So anything I say that might be forward looking statements, just take that into, into advisement. Um, uh, and then I want to talk about what's happening here in California um, and, and elsewhere. There's so many pesticide issues happening. And just recently, chlor February, chlorpyrifos was banned by the state of California. And I was on the chlorpyrifos alternatives task force. That was quite uh, an experience, I'll have to say. But there's, there's more coming with uh, neonics and fumigants. You all know about glyphosate and then, of course, dicamba drift in other states. But it's never ending on the pressure on pesticides. And it takes several hundred thousand chemicals to find one new chemical pesticide. And it takes 12 years, approximately, and almost $300 million. And then if you look at the chart on the right, if you look at the number of launches versus new leads, by the big agrochemical companies, there's, you know, there's some good discoveries there, but many fewer of them are actually making it to market. So the pipelines of new active ingredients at the big agrochemical companies are pretty thin. Well, biologicals we think can actually bridge that gap. So what are the three categories of biologicals? Well, we've got bioprotection. It, you know, biopesticides is another term. Biorationals. But um, the, the global uh, groups that are uh, trade groups are now, call, instead of calling it biopesticides, because pesticides is just like the agrochemical chemical industry says crop protection, we're calling it bioprotection now. But I'll still use biopesticides interchangeably throughout. Um, it's a fast growing, in fact, bioprotection, biopesticides is the fastest growing category of crop in, inputs. Oh, it's still small relative to the large $60 billion chemical pesticide category, which is flat in growth. The biostimulates, stimulants, which are for uh, reducing crop stress or increasing crop health and yields, is a, also a multi-billion dollar market, very fragmented still and growing also at double digits. The bio fertilizer or bio nutrient market um, is growing at a good clip as well. Uh, but dwarfed in comparison to the large uh, chemical fertilizer market. So more than 70% of biologicals are used by conventional growers, but they often pigeonholed as just for organic. I'm not dismissing organic. I mean, that's the fastest growing category of food, and these products are great for organic. But I bet most people don't realize that most vast majority, more than 70%, are used by conventional growers. And I'll talk about why that's the case. And here it is, because biologicals and chemicals integrated into a program can offer better performance and return on investment than either alone. And our company and others um, have many, many thousands, in fact, of trials showing synergistic additive and synergistic effects. And, um, and you can um, use them at full rate of the chemicals or you can reduce the rate and then you can be even more economic and even get a better, uh, use the lower label rate plus a biological in a program and, and get uh, a good ROI. Um, and, 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 you know, organic, they're going to be more, more likely to be used standalone. But in, in, in conventional agriculture, we're talking about integrations. But, you know, uh, almost all of the way that, that products are tested is always standalone. And I'll have some comments about that. Um, standalone biological against the best cocktail of chemicals is probably not the best way to look at these products. Integration is the best way. Today's products are way better and more science-based 
Um, and there's a lot of new technology in formulations, fermentation, manufacturing, and uh, genomics and molecular biology that makes these products better. There is an increase, a need for increasing grower awareness and knowledge. Earlier in the day, we heard from Anna Mick and she talked about what are the barriers to IPM. It's the same with biologicals. Very low awareness in our surveys still, surprisingly, of biologicals and low knowledge in terms of how to use them, especially because most biologicals have a very new mode of action, a novel mode of action, um, unlike chemicals, and so have to be a, a, applied and, and looked at differently. But these new modes of action are great for incorporating into programs for resistance management and delaying the development of resistance. And many of today's chemical pesticides have numbers of sprays, restrictions, and you can only spray so many um, per season because of resistance management. You can spray right up to harvest, not worry about uh, res chemical residues. So you can uh, do very good for, uh, for export markets, spray and go. Um, and then uh, faster field entry. And as we all know, labor is, is very difficult to get these days. And so you can spray in the morning and be back in the field in the afternoon because you have a shorter field re-entry. And then low risk to pollinators, people in the environment. Uh, this is um, a very important given today's consumers and especially young people demanding greater transparency and sustainability of the food production. And the big food companies imposing those sustainability requirements on their grower suppliers. We at our company had help from UC Davis Graduate School of Management to look at the carbon footprint of our maiden products uh, compared to chemical products. And we found that you could reduce your carbon footprint by 60 to 90 percent by using biologicals. That is important as more and more people are talking about uh, this topic. And then we can develop a product for a much lower cost. Um, and, and shorter time, but that has some implications about the information that we have behind the products when we launch, which is what I'm going to talk to he about here. So it's really important to understand pest control advisors, farm advisors, growers, to understand the difference in business models between a chemical pesticide and a biopesticide. I had a, a farm advisor recently say, well, I tested Grandiva against vine mealybug five years ago. It didn't work. And I said, so um, what about recently? And he said, well, I bet you're gonna tell me you have a new formulation. And I said, you're darn right, I'm gonna tell you I have a new formulation because we are working with microorganisms that are living and we can continually tweak them and make them better and better and better. Uh, you, you can, uh, uh, every year that you have a, a microbial, you can actually tweak it and, and you will still be able to uh, increase the yields and potency over time and then not to mention the, the new formulations to develop. So big chemical, massive upfront chemicals, uh, uh, upfront capital, 12 years and almost 300 million, thousands of field trials, launch big globally. And so when it gets to market, you know, the grower's gonna have, or pest control advisor, gonna have a good idea of what it does because of all that data behind it. You can get a, a biopesticide to market really quickly. So in three to five years and less than $10 million. So when it's launched, it's gonna be version 1.0. It's not gonna have thousands of field trials behind it. It might have 150 and it will have a much smaller label. It'll have you know, a few pests and, and uh, crops on the commercial label. Although the EPA master label will have everything. Uh, companies print only on the label what they have data for. So uh, you're gonna have a much smaller label in the first version 1.0. Then as we get more data, we add crops and pests to the label. And then if there's new formulations, you can have version 2.0. So it's a, it's a, it's a more incremental um, stepwise improvement of biologicals. And that's really important to know. So you don't wanna uh, trash a biological because version 1.0 doesn't have everything perfect about it. It's a good product. There are growers who wanna use it because it's serving an unmet need but it's not gonna have the perfection of a chemical. And I think that's really important. They serve, um, uh, they still serve grower needs though, uh, where, where there's needs in the market. Now, the EPA, Biopesticide Pollution Prevention Division, regulates biopesticides or biorationals, biocontrol, whatever you wanna call it. And 
the California Department of Pesticide Regulation, of course. And there's been a 70 year history of safe use of biopesticides after the first BT was commercialized. And there's never been an environmental or human health incident. So uh, they're well regulated. The US EPA has the most efficient regulatory process in the world. There's two branches. One is called the microbial branch and the other one is called the biochemical branch. Just because it's natural doesn't mean it's safe. You have to prove it. So like on the biochemical side, you have to prove it has a non-toxic mode of action to the pest or the pathogen, plant pathogen. And, and you, so it has to work on the pest or pathogen in a, in a non-toxic way. And I'll give you some examples of that in a minute. So what's required for registration? Both chemicals and biologicals start at the exact same place on the requirements for tox testing. So you start with tier one with the rat studies and the skin studies and um, eye studies. You have to do a five batch analysis. In our case, we would have to ferment in, in what would be commercially representative fermentation batch five times to prove that we can make it consistently. Now, we have a, a, a requirement that is actually more strict than chemicals. We can have no human pathogens. That's not a requirement for a chemical pesticide, by the way. Um, and so uh, we have to shoot, show that there's actually none and that's even stricter than food. <laughs> And we have to do um, ecological effects. And we, another thing that we do differently from chemicals, we have to do 30 day feeding studies. So longer term effects on these, um, on these uh, non-targets. And uh, that can be a challenging, certainly with, a, with something like a lacewing or lady beetle or parasitic wasp to keep them that long or Daphnia. Uh, we have to do an endangered species review and then prove that it would be safe for food use so that you can get exempt from tolerance. Um, spray right up to harvest. So if you have any direct toxic effects in this tier one, just like a chemical, we would have to do tier two or tier three studies. Now on honeybees, even though we have no di direct toxic effects in tier one, um, EPA and DPR are requiring tier two and tier, two, th tier three studies from us and still even putting warning labels on the label, even if we have non-toxic no, no toxicity to bees, I'll just give you a heads up on that. So the label on some of biologicals are not actually reflective of their true safety. I will mention that. It's just a caution on the, uh, we don't exactly know exactly all the requirements to get those warning labels off of our, because we have some clean studies, uh, but we're working with the agencies on that. And California, of course, requires efficacy data, the only state, but all states and the EPA can call in the data if, if they need to. Now on the organic side, there's two logos that are used for organic products, uh, for biopesticide products. And uh, the for organic production, little tri triple leaf logo, oh, you'll see for organic production or can be used in organic production right below the triple leaf logo. This is the National Organic Pr Program logo. And when you sub we submit a product to the EPA, they will, they have a memorandum of agreement with the NLP and they will review it and then allow it uh, for organic production or not. OMRI, nonprofit, everybody, would know, everybody knows what the Organic Materials Review Institute is, but it's actually not required for biopesticides if you have the NOP. But we, most companies get both of them because uh, the gr growers and PCAs generally recognize the OMRI seal uh, more so than the NOP seal. The other two, of course, are for food and farming certifications. But going back to what are, what's actually a biopesticide versus a biochemical. So all of these chemical pesticides, all of these pesticides, some of which are natural, are actually registered as chemicals and not registered as biopesticides. So abamectin is a fermentation product. Um, it is, uh, has a toxic mode of action. It works on the nervous system, the GABA system of the uh, of, and, and kills some other non-target organisms. So it's considered a toxic mode of action, registered as a chemical, even though it's a natural product. Same with success, uh, spinosad, uh, Entrust, the brands there, Entrust is the organic formulation of the spinosads from the microbe, Saccharopolyspora spinosa, the compounds produced by that microbe are very good insecticides and used in organic 
But again, it's registered as a chemical pesticide because it's a toxic mode of action, works on the nervous system of the pest, and it does actually have some uh, dental effect to bees. And I, th I don't think very few people probably don't know about that. Um, and so it, it, it is registered as a chemical. And then uh, mimic or confirm is, a, is actually not, has been modified from its natural juvenile hormone, insect hormone uh, compound, same with the strobilurins, they've been modified from their original compound discovered from a mushroom. Um, and so those are not nature identical. So those are registered as chemicals. And then uh, pyganic pyrethrums from flowers, of course, is actually also got a toxic mode of action, works on the so sodium channel of the insects and can kill fish. So it is used as organic, but not as a biopesticide. So the biopesticide category registered by the Biopesticide Pollution Prevention Division is the lowest risk category of products. Now, why do we even look, why do we look at the natural world? Um, yeah, we know that not everything in, in nature is safe, but we have a good regulatory system to help us prove that. Well, more than 50% of your human drugs are from natural sources, but only about 15% of pesticides. So we have a huge world out there where we can still find these for, for decades um, to continue to find uh, biologicals from plants and microbes. Digitalis is a heart drug from, from a foxglove and Taxol is a, a, from, um, from the Pacific U is a breast cancer drug and then of course your antibiotics and so forth. So we in here in Davis, we are not doing discovery now, but at one point we were screening 100 to 200 microbes a day. We were bringing in samples from areas of high biodiversity Organic so soils are a fantastic place to look. Our mo most recently California registered product, Stargus, is a Bacillus nakamurai we found from an organic rice field in Northern California. So you can isolate from leaf surfaces, from roots, from soil, from hot springs or water, what have you. But the higher the biodiversity, the better chance you're gonna find something interesting. So we isolate on um, petri plates, and then the, the scientists will pick individual microbe colonies off of those, uh, the petri plate with lots of different uh, microbes in the primary plate, um, like here. And then they'll isolate one per, per plate. We do mini fermentations. Then we test against a range of weeds, pests, and pathogens, and um, test multiple times to make sure we have a consistent, um, consistently performing uh, effective product. Then of course we have uh, take it out in the greenhouse and outdoors. Uh, once we have efficacy, we will we will uh, get a gene sequence and find out whether it appears to be a novel microbe or a novel strain. We will we have a natural product chemistry group that identifies the compounds that are produced by the microbe or in a plant in case of a plant extract that causes the pesticidal activity. This is very important and actually very few companies do this. We wanna take our product to a higher level of efficacy and consistency. So every single batch has a specific level of that natural cocktail of compounds. And there's many, co many compounds in our products that are causing the pesticidal activity. Instead of one single compound like a chemical pesticide, we have multiple compounds that synergize each other in the broth or in the case of a plant extract. We then of course uh, would scale in a case of a microbe, do many, many hundreds of fermentations to figure out the best conditions to grow the microbe with the lowest cost and the most of those pesticidal compounds, scale, and of course, uh, all the, the toxicology studies for, set, for regulatory and formulation studies. These microbes and plants produce compounds that are so biodegradable. Our biggest challenge is their biodegradability. Grandivo, for example, in, when we first were developing it, found out that the compounds that are pesticidal were gone in sunlight in a couple hours. Well, that doesn't make a good, a good product. So we had to add sunscreens to it to uh, make it uh, persist a little bit longer. So what are some products that are available um, out in the market for citrus? There's, uh, well, you know, I, there's actually um, Bovaria bassiana, but I could not find that. It says a range of sucking insects and psyllids, but I don't see that it's registered for citrus yet. Um, the Bovaria products. But the Certus Apopka strain of Azaria is registered, and I do know growers who are using it for Asian citrus psyllid, um, and it's called PFR 97. 
and then two from our company, which I'll talk about two new species of bacteria, Chromobacterium subsugi, found from under a hemlock tree in Maryland by USDA ARS scientist. And then we commercialized it. And then we discovered our own Burkholderia rhinogensis, new species from a temple guard, a Buddhist temple garden in Japan. Um, and uh, uh, both of these are very interesting bacteria I'll talk about. Now, there's a lot more biochemicals available than microbials for citrus. And there's a lot of uh, products from neem. And there's different brands. I don't have all of them here. But I, I have some data. I'll show you that neem's pretty good uh, against uh, Asian citrus psyllid in a program. Um, and uh, recommending, again, nothing to be standalone, but in a program. And there's both neem oil and then there's azadiractin, which is the active ingredient from the neem tree, um, different versions of, of products from the neem. And then the most recent is by a company called Terramera in Vancouver, Canadian company that uh, has a brand called Rango that is cold pressed neem oil with a new, new formulation. Then there's um, so a, a number of other plant-based extracts and oils and mineral oil, paraffinic oil is a very good for, for psyllids. I'll show you some data. Um, the, the surround, the clays also repel psyllids and then uh, potassium silicate also has some activity. So those are the number of things that uh, can be incorporated for organic, but all of these can be rotated with chemicals for um, resistance management. Now in Florida, they've overused the chemicals and, and <laughs> the psyllids are resistant to the neonics and a number of other products. We don't want that to happen here as one of our earlier speakers said. So let's talk about um, some of the data we have from our company and some of the use. I'm not, I, I do have a lot of detail here. We can save for questions or send more information later, but I don't wanna uh, get too much into the details of how they use, but just overview. So again, this is a new bacterial species showing you here on a Petri plate. And there's several patented, we, we do patent the compounds, active compounds of, diff, of a variety of different chemical classes, which is great for resistance management. So there's, there's different actual chemical classes and then compounds within those classes. So there's, you have your own uh, uh, multi-factor um, uh, com compounds right in, the, in one product. It's a killed bacteria. EPA required us to kill it because it's a Burkholderia. And there's some human pathogens, Burkholderia, but this is, a, is not a human pathogen. We did the full gene sequence. It's got a clean bill of health, but it's just a carryover from what EPA classifies all Burkholderia. Um, um, and so uh, we, we have to kill it and it is a liquid formulation. So we're relying on the compounds, not on the, the living bacteria in this case. And it's got very broad spectrum. Uh, the same bacteria also kills nematodes, but that's a different product called Magistine. And we have data that's non-toxic to bees and, and uh, we're doing some work on Varroa mite and found that um, we, we figured because it's not toxic to bees and it kills mites that it might have some Varroa mite activity. And we do have a, a small company who's working on that with us. And we've done all the pollination studies in um, citrus and apples and almonds and there's no effect on pollination. So what does it do? It's a new mode of action and it has, um, we don't know the actual mode of action on the insect's receptor you know, yet, but we're, we see the, the gross abnormalities and the effect on the um, cuticle and it causes this melanization and stunting and um, it's slow kill. So it's like an insect, novel insect growth regulator. And it works both by context. You can put it on the back of an insect or they can eat it. Um, and then we've done a number of studies on um, a number of, of beneficials and uh, show that it is not minimal to no effect on those. And um, a number of pests that it can be used on, including citrus, and we do have quite a bit of data around the globe on uh, ACP, which I'll talk about, but a number of other pests as well, including citrus rust mites. Uh, again, I wanna go into the details of this. We can talk about it later if anybody wants to know about all the use patterns, um, same with, um, with the, the water and pH and such. Um, moving on to Grandivo, which is also a new species of bacteria, showing you the Petri plate with the bright purple bacteria. And that purple pigment is one of the key compounds that is a repellent and stops feeding in less than a minute. Um, that's called violacin, that purple pigment, very important for the pesticidal activity. 
And again, um, this is not a killed bacteria, but we ferment it and then there's no resting spores like in a bacillus. So the bacteria die out, but it's, it's not, um, it's, it's not uh, killed. They just happen to die on their own. And it is a WDG. And again, very broad spectrum. It also, like Venerate, has nematode activity, but we haven't commercialized it for that. And again, has low risk on beneficials, pollination, okay. And we have a company that's done quite a bit of work for us on hive beetle and without any effect on the bees whatsoever or the honey and it wants to commercialize it for hive beetle. Again, um, broad, broad spectrum of generally low risk for all the beneficials. And how, do, what is it, how does it do? It's not active by contact at all, so it has to be eaten, unlike venerate. And the, that purple pigment causes a, a immediate agitation and repellency. The bugs hate it. They want to get it off themselves. But when they do ingest it, when they're preening, they get it, um, or they bite it on a leaf, and it dis disrupts their gut. Um, and it causes them to have diarrhea and also throw up. And uh, it also reduces egg laying, fecundity, egg hatching. Um, so it has a whole population effect. Uh, while it stops feeding in less than one minute, it's very slow kill like Venerate also slow kill. So um, this big compound on the right is called a chromamid and it's a compound we discovered novel uh, and it causes the, you can see this leaf beetle is this pink from the back of it. It's, and that's actually it's diarrhea. <laughs> and um, and uh, it also, so it, it affects the whole digestive tract. And that compound combined with several proteins we found produced by the bacteria work together. If you just have the chromomid alone, it's probably 40% effective. You add some of these proteins to it and then it boosts it up to 90-100%. Um, Violacin also works in, in, co in combination, which is that one on the left, and repels them. And we've had to develop a special assay to do quality control on this, because if you just use a regular insecticide assay, you'll, you won't get good results, because uh, you, have to, you have to show that the insects are re being repelled, and then eventually they die. But a, just a typical 24, 48 hour knockdown test isn't gonna show you anything. So here's an example of potato psyllid and the effect on the uh, reproduction. We also have data from aphids and a number of other pests showing this. Um, that you can, oh, and a spotted wing drosophila can show that you can suppress oviposition and egg laying um, by this product. And um, so while someone may be testing it or a grower using it and seeing that it's not doing anything in 48 hours, we tell them you've got to wait some few days. And also um, it's, it's season, it's, it's generation long control of, of the pest because you're talking about uh, working, working on the whole uh, life cycle of the of the pest. Here's showing you the repellency. This is work by Tracy Lesky at USDA, showing you the movement after from a half to four and a half hours of brown marmorated stink bug applied to a glass slide. And compared to MBI-203 is Grandivo, MBI-206 is Venerate. Venerate doesn't have that repellency effect, but you can see the, 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 the higher the bar is that they just hate this stuff and they're trying to move, ar move around to get, a get away from it but they got enough by walking on the slide and preening themselves to, to cause their death. And so, but you could see how um, it's, it's slow kill and you get your, your peak death over um, seven days. So, you know, when you have IPM, generally the tenant of IPM is you work, you, you let the bugs build up to an economic injury level and then you knock them down. That isn't gonna work for these modern biologicals because um, they don't work that way just like as I described. So it's much better to treat when you have the um, egg laying or ov ovipositing adults out there before the populations build up and then um, uh, use them that way because uh, otherwise you're gonna be disappointed and, and they just don't work in the way chemical pesticides do and they're knocked down. Now looking at uh, some of the things that you have to take into consideration for biologicals, this shows you Grandivo, uh, the LC50, so the concentration to kill 50% of the insects on the left is Grandivo, and then adjuvants that were tried. And, um, and you can see that the LC50 in the, in the middle of the slide, are, uh, there's 
soy, soy uh, LI, LI 700 and Tactic uh, organosilicon did not, um, was not good for this product and increased the LC50. Whether that translates to reduction in the field, I don't know, because this is lab, da lab data, but it's important that, uh, that we consider the type of chemistry added to these types of biological because can de destroy the natural chemistry that's in the, um, in the product. Another thing to consider is the spray application. Generally, you see, you know, what we hear more is better. But in this case, while generally, you know, 50 to 100 G gallons per acre is the typical for big for trees, um, what we're seeing is that marketable fruit was much better and better than the standard. And this is for mites on acromite by using a lower amount. Well, why is that? Because if you use too much water, you're just it's just rolling off the leaves and there's not enough of that lethal dose ingestion wise when they're feeding to cause the effect that you want. So um, it's really important to get enough coverage without having it all fall off the plant. So I will skip again some of the details here. Um, just checking on my time. Yeah, okay, I'm fine. Okay, and, um, uh, and, and then get into some of the data. So I'm not going to show you all the data. We have a lot of data, and I, I just to show you some representative data. But for Asian citrus psyllid, we have data from US, Mexico, Brazil, and South Africa. Now, we don't have California data. Um, I'll mention, because there's, there, they were not, there's no, not really a good way to do outdoor trials. We've had UC look at these products indoors, and they don't do well in those types of tests, particularly Grain Devo, because if you put Grain Devo inside of a cage, bugs inside of a cage, and then apply Grain Devo, the insects have nowhere to go because of that repellent effect. They're stuck inside the cage, and, um, and then when you start raiding them, they're, you're gonna still see them around. And so, um, it, it, and, and you don't, you're not measuring overposition or um, the, the reduction in egg laying or that, generation long control. So the, the tests that are used for testing chemicals are just not great for this. So uh, we've relied on field studies from uh, around the world to get our data for ACP, going all the way back in Florida to 2011. Now Stargus, which is the Bacillus nakamurai, the first Bacillus nakamurai on the, on the market, which is the one from, we discovered from the rice field, is um, uh, it's very good for, we found for post bloom fruit drop, plant health, uh, regalia also very good for citrus plant health. I'm not gonna show you data there, but also it's a biofungicide. Regalia is an extract of giant knotweed and also has data from around the world on, on a number of plant diseases, in this case, citrus canker. Uh, but it also increases the growth of the tree. It has a, a stimulus effect by an induced systemic resistance and a systemic acquired resistance, both effects uh, on the plant, um, which uh, creates a healthier tree. Haven is a relatively new product of ours. It is an extract of coconut oil. There's sterile alcohols and stearic acids um, that are, when you spray on the tree, um, it reduces sun stress by helping the plant take up more water and nutrients. It is not a sun blocker like surround, it, it, it does, doesn't have a blocking effect. It is clear, but it is actually um, helping the plant um, uh, reduce sun, sun stress, and therefore you get a healthier plant, less sun damage, and higher yields. So on ACP for Grain Devo, for conventional acres, we so ne see no reason why it couldn't be rotated with chemical products to get good control, but all, you know, the data is always tested standalone and we have good standalone data. We don't see this product actually being very, very used much for ACP. Um, chemicals are still the preferred route, but um, we, you know, there's use for organic, but, but we don't, we, we sh it should be rotated or incorporated um, in a program with chemicals. Um, there's no reason why it wouldn't be. Um, this is uh, some comparisons against some older chemistry, Portal and Danatol, showing very good efficacy. Against, um, it has both adults and, uh, adult and uh, nymph activity. The activity is better on nymphs for both products, but same with chemicals. Here, um, um, 
I actually didn't, I have the adult data and the both of them, both of, uh, I didn't put it in here, but both uh, Delegate and Grand Devo have effects on adults, but not as good as on the NIMPs. And they're both about equal in performance. These are not statistically different from each other. Um, and, um, um, and compared to the untreated, again, Florida, some Florida data from uh, the late Phil Stansley. And then um, Venerate, that was Grand Devo, Venerate, uh, in this case, compared way back when in 2011 to a neonic thymethoxin um, in a tank mix with abamectin for mites, um, and also compared to Danitol. So very good, very good control. Now, this is interesting. This is a trial by a large citrus grower doing a demo in Florida. And they were trying to see if they could get 0% control, 0% nymphs or adults on the citrus. So go from relatively high populations to zero and they were able to achieve it. So they mixed Grand Evo with oil and were able to, and the, you see the pre-counts on the top of the slide. And then uh, they used two different adjuvants. Uh, one was orange oil and the other one was spray oil. And I would say that based on our experience that uh, the spray oil worked better than the orange oil. You can see a little bit of return of the uh, of the psyllids at 21 days, but with the spray oil, 4, 435 spray oil, it went, lasted all the way to 21 days, which is pretty impressive for some uh, biological products. Now, this is also from Florida, um, from uh, uh, researchers there, Stalinsky and others, and uh, Stansley. And um, this again was the point of, can biologicals give you the same control as a conventional program? And indeed, they were able to show you that. So the blue line is the untreated, and the red is the chemical, and the green is the biological program. They're really not statistically different. And But is this really IPM? I mean, my gosh, who wants to spray this many times of either chemicals or biologicals? So um, I echo some of the comments in the earlier speakers that um, this is no way to go for California citrus. We will have failed. IPM if we end up going this way. Uh, there, there really needs to be a holistic IPM program developed. When I talk to growers in, in Florida, they're frustrated that they've had to rely on uh, multiple chemical sprays and then they got resistance. When, they, when I walk the fields with them, they'll say, okay, I see this variety over here is giving us more tolerance and higher yields than another variety. I tried this, and you'll hear later from um, on some biostimulants. I tried this microbial mix or this this um, uh, biostimulant, and it seems to be boosting my plant health. Or I tried this nutrient. Um, this this nutrient program is working better than another nutrient program. Another another um, a block. I've got some cover crop, and so I'm trying all these different things. But where is my systems integrator that can help me integrate all of those tools onto the farm? and then uh, add in my um, things to enhance my natural biocontrols and then use a biological if I, uh, biopesticide if I need it. You know, that's what we're missing. And I really, really hope that this webinar and, and going from here, that that will prompt us in California to really leapfrog over Florida and, and not make the same mistakes. Moving on um, to some data from Brazil. This is comparing Grandivo to Provado, which is imidacloprid, um, neonic. And you can see that um, the populations are declining to um, uh, exactly, it's not statistically different from neonic in this case. So again, um, some very good data uh, on Grandivo in Brazil. Now, this was a program in uh, on lemons in Mexico, and they were looking at organic blocks here comparing um, Grain Devo to Neem, and um, they're getting some very good reduction in the psyllids um, compared to the untreated, which is the tall bar, dark blue bar. And there's no difference between the Neem and the, um, and the Grain Devo, so it would be a great organic program to rotate those types, those products. Um, and then, so that's, that's a, just a smattering of data we have on, on Asian citrus psyllid. We, I, I'm not showing you it all. We've got uh, a lot more trials, but just to, to give you a representative sample. Now on um, citrus rust mite, we have data again from Florida. And um, again, showing you that uh, Venerate can um, 
it worked just as well as the uh, chemical standard here, in this case was the uh, Envidor. Um, same for Grain Devo. Um, and uh, um, in this case, these are both of those, the, the last trial I showed you in this one is just one application. So uh, we were looking in this trial of how long could Grain Devo last with, after just one application. You see the marks might start starting to come back, but um, for, a, for a biological, um, so why, why, if this is such a biodegradable product and we know that the compounds don't last more than a couple of days, why is it lasting this long? Well, we're theorizing that we're getting that population suppression effect on the total population. So we're stopping the next generation from developing because of the effect on overposition and fecundity. Uh, must be because we do know that this is very biodegradable and just doesn't last on the leaf very long. So they're getting enough to have this population effect. Um, South Africa, we're trying, we have an old formulation that we no longer sell in the United States, which is the wettable powder. We switched over to the WDG, but in locations outside the US because of the, the longer regulatory time frame, we do still have the WWP uh, and we're comparing, com that's called the DF which is actually a WP. It's really not more, it's more of a WP than a dry flowable. And then we're comparing it to Venerate. Venerate was uh, much more sensitive to rate. Uh, the lower rate of the higher rate was, was very good. And then there was no difference between the, the old formulation and the new formulation of Grain Devo compared to the commercial standard on Rustmate. We do have some, so a question on Leaf Miner. I went and I looked on my computer. We do have some old data on Leaf Miner. Uh, which I didn't, I'm not showing, but we do have some um, for both products and there was some efficacy. So some recommendations. When targeting ACP, um, you can apply venerate um, lower, when there's low populations, use a lower rate. When there's higher populations, use a higher rate and, and it's best to use with a crop oil. And then target the feather flush um, and apply when adults or, or eggs are observed and before the populations build up. And then um, you can add in Grandivo for mites um, and it'll make a nice program. And we, we don't really, I know you have to get the trees covered, but, but as I mentioned, the higher water, higher water rates just are not great for these products. So moving on to um, some data on Haven, which I mentioned is the, uh, extract of coconut oil and uh, citrus can get some sunburn as you see here on the upper left. In this case we got a strong yield increase and a reduction in damage um, and uh, these were uh, ap first application was just post bloom. This product is not a blocker so cannot should not be applied on the fruit when the fruit is fully developed. It has to be applied much earlier um, to affect the, uh, to give this yield effect and health effect. So just post bloom and then two sprays. And then if um, it's, uh, the, the, the crop is still under um, some, a lot of sun and heat, then we would add a third spray. And uh, I've used this last year in my, uh, in my own citrus on my, my in my yard. Um, and, and I got some really good results. I try to test all my own products. Um, and, uh, and, and I skipped a year where I, I just wasn't, one year I used it and the next year I just didn't get around to it and the damage was, difference was dramatic, obviously anecdotal, but we have, <laughs> we have real data to prove it. Um, Stargus um, post bloom fruit drop is a, is a significant concern. And this is a commercial demo in Florida. We do have some California data, uh, recent data uh, coming. And uh, it is uh, compared to Headline, which is a strobilurin used for uh, plant health and, and fruit drop in this case. And uh, got some, um, um, here's an example where, although it wasn't statistically different numerically, there was a little bump when the two were combined together. So now I'm going to, I'm gonna save plenty of time for questions, hopefully. Um, it will just wrap up um, with there's a lot going on about the science behind microbes, plants, and soil health. This is a hot topic these days. We've heard some earlier speakers talk about this, but I'm gonna give you some real science-y background on this because I, I, that's what I do, um, bring science to biologicals. There's companies more every day that are helping farmers decode what's going on in your soil. So you can send in a soil sample and then they'll tell you what microbes are there by 
um, figuring out what DNA from those microbes is there. One is trace genomics. There's a more recent one called Biome Makers. And then I came across one in Taiwan that claims to leapfrog um, the, with the best technology. We're, we're going to test it out and see. But I do know growers who are using these and finding out um, how much biodiversity or microbial diversity they have in the soil. And um, you might you want to know that. So you, know, you want to know that more than you just have bacillus subtilis or bacillus amylolicifaciens you want, or, or pseudomonas putida or pseudomonas fluorescens, you want to know how many strains, different strains of those species you, because every strain is different um, of each microbe. Just because um, it's the same species doesn't mean it, it's the same at all, which is why the regulatory agencies, when we submit a product, have to uh, we, we regu they regulate by strain, not by species. So that's why there's m so many multiple bacillus amyloliquefations that are registered, each different, most of them are different from each other. So what do we know? Well, soil health is local. You can change dramatically your microbial, uh, the microbes in your soil by your irrigation patterns, your, your, like we heard today, whether you're putting in compost or in or, or green manures or cover croppings changes, that all changes. Your, your, so you would need to sample uh, different blocks and different places around the farm to really figure out what's going on. Um, I already mentioned some of the things about the strains. And what's really cool today is that plant breeders ha ha cannot be blind to microbes anymore. You cannot breed, be a plant breeder and breed a plant variety without considering what it's doing to the microbes in, in, the, in the soil. And I'll give you some examples because different plant varieties recruit different microbes. This is very exciting stuff. Um, uh, uh, and there's, we're just at the early stages really understanding the, what's going on beneath our feet um, in the soil. And then as you might expect, organic soils are higher in biodiversity, creating a healthier plant healthier soil. And, and uh, so um, there's now a healthy soil initiative around the country, around the globe for conventional farmers. That's great, but it's really something organic farmers have been doing forever. So there's a, <coughs> there's um, a group of plant hormones that are called the strigolactones that have been recently well, um, been looked at. And here's a structure. What they do is they signal not only do they sig signal bad weeds like witch weed, but they also signal mycorrhizae to come to the root. Sorry, excuse me. All right. And they're, they're saying, hey, mycorrhizae, I've got cake, chocolate cake for you. I've got good stuff for you. So the mycorrhizae are drawn to the roots because of the, these uh, plants are pumping out the strigolactones. This is very exciting stuff. And you can now breed plants with uh, different uh, levels of these signaling compounds. A uh, soybean board did a study showing you this, the one on the left was bred to attract mycorrhizae by changing uh, the genes that code for the production of those compounds and the right didn't have it. Now, I haven't seen any studies in citrus, but this would be a really cool area to work on in citrus because most plants um, get a, are, have mycorrhizal associations and other microbe associations, but it doesn't have to be just mycorrhizae. Here's one from fluorescent, fluorescent pseudomonids, bacteria, that produce this compound. These are called cyclic lip, lipopeptides because they have a circular structure and then they have a, a lipo, a fatty part. And uh, this is work from Germany and they were, she was using a tropical plant, a cocoa yam. And what she found is that higher quality soils had a much more diverse group of, of, of pseudomonas and much more uh, diverse chemistry. So different, many different kinds of these cyclic lipopeptides and, and certain varieties. So the red cocoa yam had, was much more resilient and had a lot less pythium root rot than the white cocoa yam. And that was because the red cocoa yam supported a much more diverse group of microbes that produced a more diverse group of these cyclic lipopeptides. Really exciting stuff. So every plant system is now being, um, being looked at to decode some of these cool associations. So I'll go into Q&A now, but I'll just end up that, like I already said, new holistic IPM programs need to be developed. 
we're not just talking about input substitution or just rotating sprays uh, anymore. We have to incorporate all the tools and, and uh, knowledge of soil health and plant varieties, cover cropping and all the things. And, uh, and we need more systems integrators. We've got a bunch of them on the, on the, on the pa as panelists today um, and, and excited to, to have that kind of expertise. But I did, I did mention at the Chloropyrifos Alternatives Working Group that I, th I thought because of the new modes of action of some of these biologicals that uh, many existing IPM programs are, are a bit outdated. And some agreed with me, some didn't. Uh, but uh, I, I do think that uh, we need to look at IPM in a different way. And there's a number of uh, monographs and initiatives doing this. In fact, California DPR and UC IPM had a, had a meeting um, that put out a, a big tome on, on how, to, how to do more modern IPM, which, which I recommend uh, to, to you read, actually. And uh, I'm kind of tired of, of the same old paradigm of testing one biological against the best cocktail of chemicals and then someone saying, oh, that biological didn't work as well. That's not how you look at these products, as I described and hopefully convinced you, that integrated programs, and it's, it's more than just looking at them side by side. And what we see over and over and over again with our data is that we might have, for a biofungicide, you might have lower disease um, area under the disease pro pro progress, a higher area under the disease progress curve, lower percent disease control, or in the case of insects, lower percent um, control or more bugs. But the biologicals may give you the highest or as good as as the chemical or even higher in marketable yield. So that's why I mean you have to look a little differently um, at IPM in this way because marketable yield is dollars, our return on investment. That's what the grower wants to see. It's, it's not just the number of bugs, it's what they're yielding. And um, often studies are just looking at percent control or the number of bugs and don't take it all the way to plant health and yield. And then they're missing the real benefits of these types of products and the true holistic IPM. So I will stop there. Um, a resource, I started this trade group, biological products it used to be called the Biopesticide Industry Alliance, now called the Biologicals Products Industry Alliance because it has both biostimulant and biopesticide companies in it. Um, and it is a trade group where um, all the companies that, not all, but a lot of companies, hundreds of companies that are in this arena are, uh, are in this group and uh, another a source of knowledge. So with that, I'll stop and I will take questions. Thank you, Pam. Wow. I know it's a lot of information in a short time, but <laughs> I'll take questions. Okay. Do I look at, do, I, do you want me to, to go and look at the questions? I can do that. You can if you want to, okay. Brett can help. There on the chat. Let me see. Greg support. I see one about, do you have data on broad mite? On broad mite. Okay, yeah. wait a minute, let me get back to my chat. Wanna, okay. uh, stop sharing your screen. Okay, so do I, do I stop, did I, did I stop share? It seems in my view. In process. Okay, I'll stop share. There we there go. We go. <laughs> Got it. All right, okay, so broad mites. Um, Good question. I don't recall seeing any data against broad mites. There you go. Michael, I see you have a number of comments. Is he like this black one? Yeah. Yeah, I've, I just saw uh, just that taro. I was amazed how much more productive that red taro was. And you, you hit that particular story. But that's not like about this, uh, what we're talking about. So anyway. Well, well, I mean, I think every plant system is, is now, you're going to see that once they, but she, I mean, this, this research has been working on, on this area for 20 years. So we're not talking about uh, a research that takes, you know, as a short period of time, but, but uh, I, I think with citrus, it would be great for some public money to fund uh, some studies like this and find out, I'm sure there are citrus varieties that recruit microbes better than others. It would be fantastic to find that out. Yeah. In uh, biological control using insects, we uh, talk about where the insect came from. So if it came from a, a similar environment, you know, this had the same temperature, humidity, you know, climate, that sort of thing, that's more likely to succeed in, in the uh, 
area where it's going. And so um, we're, we're selling, you know, a, a lace wing that comes uh, originally from uh, Georgia out of pecans, um, Crescent Parallel, Riffle Abras. And it kind of sort of works, but, but gee, wouldn't it be nice if we had uh, a locally adapted species? Kent Dana has been working with uh, Crescent Parallel Comanche that is um, native to the Central Valley. And uh, he thinks that works a lot better for, well, he, at least he's seeing it feeding on some of the pests there. And, and so they're looking at um, uh, having some people grow it uh, for the ACP program uh, in um, um, Los Angeles and Central Valley potentially. So uh, yeah, so species are, and not um, the strain or ecotype, as we talk about in, in insect biology, is, is very, very important. I didn't realize that. So it's just like with microbes, the, the uh, strain is, is critical. Um, so yeah. uh, interesting. Is it local, locally adapted or? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Jim, so, you so want to comment on that? Yeah. Okay, there's a question here. What are the effects of grain devo on parasitic wasps? And that's required for EPA registration and it's not toxic to parasitic wasps? Um, generally, the, you know, the compounds, the microbial uh, compounds, uh, how much is the recovery? You know, how much compounds do you generally require, uh, let's say from a liter of uh, culture? Oh gosh, we're talking <laughs> about, so when we first discover the, the, the bacteria, you're talking about microgram quantities in a liter. And then as time goes on, we might um, through fermentation optimization get into the uh, milligram levels and then even maybe five years later get into the gram levels of compounds. So it just de depends on where we are in the fermentation optimization cycle of the microbe. And I bought a plant in Mexico when I was at AgriQuest um, and uh, it was an erythromycin antibiotic plant. The plant manager ran that for 25 years and he said he got a bump in in yield of erythromycin every year for 25 years. So that's kind of going to be the way it is with these types of products. We'll continue to be able to, to, and with the modern tools of molecular biology, we can do a gene sequence of the bacteria now, find out where the genes are for production of the, mic, of, of the compounds. So then we can uh, amp up the levels of compounds much faster than we would, have, would be able to in the past. We don't want to do any gene editing or GMO because we want to get these organic and, and uh, that causes all kinds of issues regulatory wise if we do that kind of manipulation of the, of the microbe, yeah. And what's the effective concentration for these compounds when you want to apply in the field? That's a good question. <laughs> I don't know the answer to that. Um, I know we have some studies on that though. We've been looking, we have been looking at what is left in the field measuring and bringing samples back. And I know our chemistry group has been looking at that, but I don't know that, that, that off the top of my head. Yeah. And uh, one last one. Uh, is your Bavaria bassiana, uh, is that a good effective on uh, potato psyllids? Yes, I, I do see, I have looked at the labels and potato psyllids uh, uh, are, is one of the registered, registered uh, pests. So I, I didn't, I did not see that citrus was on the label of the Bovaria. Um, I see that, you know, a different fungus P PFR, uh, the one from Certus is. So um, I don't know if the companies just don't have the data yet on S ACP, uh, but, but if it's active on potato psyllid, it's likely to be active on ACP. That's what we see from most of the microbials. Yeah. I may, I may get back to you on that for a little, uh, <laughs> you know, sample, because we are looking at uh, some potato trials shortly. And uh, of course, psyllids are one of the issues. So I may get back to you on that. I'm, I'm seeing a question. One study showed soy oil, soy oil reduced efficiency, others that petrol oil increased it. Was this an aberration? Um, no, actually, petrol oil was better than soy oil. So I don't think that's an aberration, actually. I, I think uh, the, uh, the, the, the petrol oil was actually a better surfactant in this case. Any other questions? Pam, We're I, right on time. I have a question, Pam, Steve. Hi, Steve. Yeah. Um, you know, in the desert agriculture, we have high pH waters. And, um, you know, pH anywhere from 7.7 7 all the way up to <coughs> eight five nine zero. 
it could be really uh, high pHs. So how important is that? Because you did say state in your uh, <clears throat> presentation, six, five to seven, five. Yeah, uh, that, that is actually pretty important for Grandivo. Um, we, we do, we do need, you, you want to, you don't want it to have to be that, that high. Yeah. So we, we, we have, have, might have to add a, a sit, might have to add something to uh, why, why is that? citric acid or something. Yeah. Is, is that just mode of action and the, what, what's the reasoning? If it gets too high, what does it destroy? So it's the, the, the compounds that we've discovered from the bacteria don't like it that alkaline. Okay. So the, the, the neutral pH is, 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 is best. It's true. It's actually be generally true for most biological, actually. So do, you have a, do you have a preference in the type of, of pH adjusters like citric acid or something that's natural as opposed to a sulfuric acid adjustment or some other type of acid? I uh, would not use sulfuric acid. Yeah, no, it's better to use something softer. Otherwise, you're going to chew up those compounds. Okay. Um, yeah, the, the, these... These natural compounds don't have any chlorines, bromines, fluorines, you know, like some most modern chemistry has fluorinated, they have, have add fluorines that by design to make it persistent. We don't have any of that stuff. So you, you could, you know, you chew up that the carbon, hydrogen, oxygen matrix of these compounds um, with, with something too harsh. Yeah. So citric acid is fine. Great question. Thanks, Steve. I'm, I'm, um, Eager to move on now. Thank you so much for that. And I know I I, I know I saw a, a comment that was yeah. I went. I, I'm always I always go very fast with a lot of info. So fortunately, you're recording this, and it will be available for reviewing later. And I'm happy to send um, the slides to anybody as well. Awesome. Thank you.